Merci. Good evening, everyone. Uh, please be seated. <clears throat> Man, this is a well-behaved audience. Never have I had to tell people to be seated. Uh, <laughs> My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and it's my very great honor to welcome all of you, and especially to welcome our remarkable panel here uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, this, this event is part of the uh, General Officers and Homeland Security Executive Program, as many of you know, as many of you are a part of it. And we are enormously proud to be a part of this uh, activity, the chance to bring together people from different services and uh, who obviously are going to be absolutely essential if we are going to cope with the kinds of disasters that seem seemingly are becoming all the more common and all the more severe, uh, most recently in Japan, but in so many other settings. My job is to quickly introduce the panel, and I'm going to try and keep it quick. Uh, each one of the people on this panel could easily merit a, a, an introduction uh, whether, w that could take up our entire time. But let me just simply say, I don't think we've had this many stars on stage ever. Um, and if you add them all up into the audience, I think we're well over 50. So it's, it's, uh, I'm, I, I stand in awe. Um, so let me, uh, let me uh, start by uh, introducing Julie Kayam, who's, uh, uh, I guess you could figure out which Obvious. one she is. Uh, <laughs> she was most recently the Assistant Secretary of Intergovernmental Affairs at DHS. Uh, where she was a, a, a principally responsible for coordinating the complicated issues around the BP spill um, last year. She has an extensive background in terrorism and national security. She was Massachusetts's first undersecretary for Homeland Security, and she was responsible for developing statewide policy on Homeland Security. Uh, and her particular focus, of course, was on prevention uh, as well as response. She's also uh, on leave from a position here at the Kennedy School, which she's going to return to, or she's going to do some teaching for us uh, next year. So we're very, very pleased uh, about that. Uh, General Craig McKinley uh, is the chief of the uh, National Guard Bureau and the senior uniformed National Guard officer in the nation, responsible for formulating, developing, and coordinating all policy pro policies, programs, and plans affecting more than half a million Army and Air National Guard personnel. And of course, uh, National Guard units inevitably pay a central role in whatever the next major event is, and that is certainly something that is, is dramatically changing over time and, and their role uh, more broadly. And so we're very, very grateful for General McKinley's um, work to enhance the Guard's capabilities. Admiral uh, Robert Papp is the, commander of the Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, he leads the largest component of the Department of Homeland Security, comprised of 42,000 active duty, 8,200 reserve, and 8,000 civilians, and 31,000 volunteer auxiliarists. Um, under his leadership, the Coast Guard was also the nation's principal response agency for the BP oil spill, and obviously was deeply involved in Katrina and many other things. The Honorable uh, Bart, uh, Bert, Bart Stupak uh, was a member of the House of Representatives from 1993 to 2011. He talks, he's now around here at the Kennedy School and uh, into politics and talks frequently about how much he misses those good old days <laughs> and what a lovely time it is to be there. He was a leader, he was the uh, chair of the House Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. He was a leader uh, on, the Na on the Great Lakes and a strong advocate for clean water with strong opposition to oil and gas drilling in the lakes. As an elected public official, uh, he brought the perspective of those who face the accountability of the ballot box and brings that to our panel here. Um, then Admiral James Winnefield is the commanding officer of uh, the Uni United States Northern Command and of the North American Aerospace, Air Aerospace Defense Command. He led the Big E, the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier through her 18th deployment, which included combat operations in Afghanistan in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, in, immediately after the 9-11 attacks. Um, in his current role, he is forging NORTHCOM as a national response force capable of supporting and integrating a wide range of federal, state, and local governments and civil society organizations. And that really is the theme tonight. I'll introduce Dutch in just a moment. It is that remarkable need and opportunity that we now have to learn from our previous um, challenges and to bring together these remarkable people. If something were to happen, th those of you in the audience and certainly these 
uh, leaders on the stage, will be responsible for coping with whatever the next disaster brings. Indeed, if all of their phones start ringing at the same time, I would say move out of the building quickly. Um, I, I don't know whether it's an advantage or disadvantage that they're all in one place at one time, but we're certainly, we, it's a huge advantage for all of us. Lastly, I want to introduce um, uh, Dutch Leonard, who is one of the, uh, along with Alan Howitt, is uh, running this uh, executive program. Uh, Dutch is the George F. Baker Jr. Professor of Public Management at the Kennedy School, and also at the, uh, he's also at the Business School. Arne Howitt is, uh, uh, along with Arne Howitt, uh, the leader of the Kennedy School's program on crisis leadership. Now, Dutch and I actually go back to college when we were roommates, and I should just simply say that back then he was a year ahead of me, and starting then and forevermore, I was always looking, trying to follow in Dutch's footsteps. <laughs> and, uh, so it's all the more appropriate that I now exit the stage since he is really <laughs> the, uh, the wise and thoughtful person uh, to serve as our moderator. But let's give one last big hand for our entire panel, and I will exit the stage. Thank you very much, David, uh, for a very kind introduction for all of us. And welcome to all of you, and thank you for your interest in this uh, compelling subject. Uh, as David observed, Arne Howitt and I have been having the privilege this week of hosting uh, the Kennedy School's first, we hope annual at least, uh, Homeland Security Executive Program for General and Flag Officers. So I've been working with this group now arrayed ahead of me here. They look very different tonight than they have for most of the week, I have to say. It's very uh, somewhat intimidating. Uh, but we're gathered tonight to speak about what I think is one of the mo most compelling subjects uh, that this nation faces, which is how we would respond and what we can do now to try to make sure that we will respond better in the case of this nation's next very large-scale emergency event. You don't have to look very far in the world today to look for examples of very large-scale events uh, that would be problematic to any nation, would stretch the capacity and resources and ingenuity of any nation on the planet. Uh, the Japanese example is the most recent one, 311. Uh, I think all of us look at that and say, if that event were to happen here, which it very well could, uh, it would be something w that would require our best efforts and best capabilities. So what can we do now to try to improve how all of that might look going forward? Uh, if we, we contemplate such an event, uh, we don't like to imagine this, but actually it's necessary if we're going to be ready. Uh, if we contemplate such an event, we, we realize, well, first, the questions are, who's going to respond to that? And how will that response be coordinated? Well, among the organizations that will respond, many will actually respond to it, but among the organizations that will respond are the three military commands that are represented here tonight by their commanding officers. Uh, we have General McKinley from the US National Guard Bureau, who oversees all of the National Guard units of the United States. And uh, Admiral Winnefeld, the commander of NORTHCOM, who oversees all the active duty forces deployed within the domestic United States. Uh, and Admiral Papp, the Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard oversees all the Coast Guard units which operate both on the coast, as the name suggests, and also in a lot of in interior waters and interior places within the U.S. So these would actually be the three military commands who would be forming, in effect, the backbone of what we think is the leadership cadre. And that's essentially what this program is about. So I just want to say and, uh, to thank these uh, three commanders for the privilege that we've had of gathering uh, some of their folks with us this week to consider these, these challenges and for joining us tonight to, to look at these very important questions. So the, an, an important performance criterion for how we do in the next large scale event will be how successfully these three organizations work together with one another and also with many other organizations, government organizations, nonprofit organizations, private organizations, and private citizens. <clears throat> so whose job is it to make that happen and what can we all do to advance that. Now, in addition, we notice that any major event is not only a technical event and an operational event, but also very much a political event. And so the question of how the interface between the political side, how the politicians are involved, how, what issues are the right issues for politicians to resolve, and what issues are those for whom uh, it should be in the bailiwick of operational officials, this is something on which we have not worked out a very successful doctrine uh, to date. And so that's another issue that we've been taking up in the program and which we're going to speak about tonight. And we have two uh, people to represent the political side of these issues. Uh, Congressman Stupak, who's looked at this as an elected official himself, and uh, Juliet Kayyem, who was an appointed official in DHS, but who lived through the political issues of the BPOL spill uh, very directly. So we've got a, a fantastic panel array. <laughs> 
for us to think about these issues. And what I want to do is to, to ask the panel to think a little bit about how, what we've learned recently about how we can continue to improve these capacities. So I thought, Admiral Papp, we might start with you. The Coast Guard was very heavily involved in the response to the BP oil spill last year. It was the main federal operational uh, command that was engaged in that. Uh, and, and it was also heavily involved in the challenge of coordinating with many other organizations. Uh, what are some of the lessons you think we've learned in that context about uh, how, from the experience of how to do better, about how the Coast Guard and other agencies, and particularly how we can coordinate better across agencies and jurisdictions? Well, thanks, Dutch. Uh, I, there are three things to come together in an event like this. First is the, the first response, the operational uh, portion of it, carrying out the tactics. And uh, all of us, and particularly people in this room, uh, work towards that their entire career. Uh, we're good at the first response. We're good at getting forces out there. But particularly when you have a prolonged event, uh, the other two aspects are going to start creeping in. First is the political overlay, and then there's the media external outreach overlay. And uh, not all of us are completely comfortable in that world, uh, nor sometimes do we understand all that is involved in that, particularly on the political side, uh, we can come to an understanding, but oftentimes we're focused on carrying out the mission, and, uh, and that's our, our first priority, as well it ought to be for the people in uniform and other first responders and other components and agencies that are dealing with it. Uh, but over time, particularly if it's a, an event like the BP oil spill, where there's a great degree of frustration that builds up, uh, you've got to work very hard on that political overlay and the external outreach overlay as well. Uh, what we found uh, is that the, the federal on-scene coordinator was Admiral Landry at the time, at the beginning, and I think she did a fine job, but as this thing grew and as it went on, you've got to have someone focused on carrying out the tactics of the operation and then almost devote someone very senior uh, to carrying on both the political and the external <laughs> outreach of all this. Uh, obviously, we, we came to a solution with Admiral Allen being named as the National Incident Commander. Uh, he became the face of the operation, the person who was going in front of the cameras, uh, who established the battle rhythm for informing the public and also acting as the interface with the, uh, uh, with the political side as well. And that allowed us to keep our operational commanders focused on carrying out the tactical operations. But even there, we found out on a local level, we, we ended up building two, incident com two major incident command posts. We actually had five, but the two major ones, one in Homa and one in, um, in Mobile, and then a unified area command, which was above it. And at the unified area command, we actually had to have two flag officers, one who would sort of be the local face in dealing with the governors in particular, uh, that ended up being uh, Rear Admiral Paul Zunkamp uh, near, at the end there. And then another flag officer working below who took care of the internal business of running the UAC. Same thing happened at the incident command posts. We ended up, the most successful one I thought was HOMA, uh, where we had Roger Lafiere, who uh, was doing most of the external work, but then we had uh, Captain Mary Austin, who was back in the headquarters, uh, really doing the internal focus. Uh, I, I have to credit Juliet Kayam. I think we're, we're, uh, we've got it st the deck stacked here for the Coast Guard because we <laughs> consider her a Coastie as well. Uh, she, she was deeply involved in all this. And uh, I think one of the points we'll make later on is that uh, the political overlay, they need to be involved in the planning and the exercises for this. Uh, the reality was about uh, six months before the beep, I'm sorry, not even six months, uh, about a three. three months before the oil spill. We had a spill of national significance uh, exercise, and we were struggling to get uh, elected officials to participate in it. Uh, Julia Kayam, I think, was the senior representative from the Department of Homeland Security that showed up for that particular exercise. And there were a lot of similarities uh, between the exercise and what actually happened during BP. And uh, she was very helpful to us to explain back to the elected officials some of the things that were going on. That's great. Thank you very much. And we'll come in, in a moment to, to her experiences in that, in that regard. Let me turn first, though, to General McKinley. Uh, General, the, the National Guard units are deployed as we speak in a number of different states. You've got people in Texas fighting fires. You've got people who, as a, resu as a result of the terrible tornadoes last night uh, in Alabama, we have National Guard units now on the ground uh, and also in, in other states as well. 
So National Guard responds to things from relatively small scale events to horrible but still within one state events to very large events like the Midwest floods in 2008 and, and Hurricane Katrina. Um, are we ready today for a really large scale event, bigger than any of those that we have contemplated? And, and how, how are you feel, feeling in terms of the, the current preparations? Well, first of all, thanks to uh, Harvard and to you Dutch for the opportunity to be back. I know many of my colleagues who are adjutants general uh, have spent time here at the Kennedy School and, and uh, we appreciate all the programs that are offered here and we are very interested in the feedback uh, from our leaders in the field on how this program went this week. Um, to credit the Founding Fathers, the National Guard is able to handle uh, emergencies, catastrophic, man-made, um, and they can do that because they are dispersed. They're in every community in the nation, in three of our territories, in the District of Columbia. And quite frankly, that's the beauty of having this dispersed force of almost a half a million people. Uh, another credit is to the Air Force and the Army uh, that equips us and trains us and that we're very proud to wear their uniforms uh, over time have given us the ability to, to integrate into the uh, total interagency process by which our nation now uh, fights these emergencies and allows uh, us to participate uh, in many cases uh, as the command and control element representing the governors of the respective states. Uh, we believe that 90 plus percent of most emergencies are handled uh, at the local level. Uh, certainly they probably don't exceed the resources of the governor, but that's the beauty of this panel here today is we're, we're living in a new age where uh, the scale, the scope of, of what we're dealing with uh, may exceed the ability of, of a a state to deal with. So your question, can we handle a major emergency today on the scale, I would assume, of 311 in Japan? And Admiral Winifred and I talked about it flying in here today. Obviously, uh, any part of that emergency in Japan would have stressed any government. I mean, an earthquake in and of, in and of itself, a tsunami in and of itself, a nuclear disaster in and of itself would have stressed anybody, but put all three together uh, tremendous challenge, uh, and I commend uh, the government of Japan and their citizenry for the resilience that I have observed. Uh, and I believe, along with I think my colleagues here, that the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Defense and all the agencies that would be brought to bear for a large-scale disaster are far uh, ahead of where we were uh, 10 years ago by necessity and that we are much better able to have a unity of effort and a command and control system which will allow uh, the responsible party to deal with the crisis. Um, but it would be uh, naive of me to say that we could handle an emergency any better than any other government could, especially government of Japan who uh, prides itself on being prepared for things like this. So um, I would say that the gentlemen and ladies in front of you today who are part of the National Guard would tell you that in their uh, areas of responsibility and command that we are much better capable, much better trained, much better equipped to handle a large-scale disaster today than we were a decade ago. And part of what you point to is the fact that there is a set of integrations now among these different military commands. So Admiral Winnefeld, it's your a challenge to oversee the, all the active duty deployments that might come to support the civil authorities and other, other groups involved. Uh, that's a new challenge. This is a new idea for how we might use uh, military forces domestically, and you have a reputation of having brought a very vibrant leadership to that challenge. Uh, so how are you feeling about how well that is uh, integrated at this point and what we need to do, to do going forward? Well, first, allow me to echo uh, my good friend, Jeremy McKinley, and the other panel members for thanking Harvard for hosting this forum and thanking you personally for uh, running it. And I also want to greet my very good partners in the National Guard who are populating a large uh, uh, number of seats in the audience. Uh, we've got a fantastic partnership, and I think that goes to part of the answer of your question. Um, <clears throat> the country now has learned a, lo a lot of lessons in, in the wake of Katrina and other events that have occurred, more recent lessons in the wake of uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And I think that we've put together a fairly robust system, a national response framework, a national incident management system, 
And if we have a hard time handling a large incident in the future, it's going to be because of capacity, not because of teamwork. And so I'm very proud to call the, uh, the, my partners in the Department of Homeland Security and also my partners in the Guard, uh, a, a very tightly knit group, a very close partnership. And there will always be mistakes made, to be sure, in any kind of a disaster response. And those mistakes, of course, will be what, what people tend to focus on. But by and large, I'm very confident that we have a, a good future in front of us in terms of teamwork. One of the things that we've managed to accomplish uh, is to tighten up our partnership with the Guard. Uh, there has historically been some daylight between the federal side and the state side in terms of what the command and control would be like for federal forces responding in support of a state operating through the, the uh, principal federal response would be run by FEMA. Uh, the state side, understandably, wanted to have tactical control of those federal forces because it's a sovereign state. They understand their state and they don't need federal forces running around in there doing things that they don't really understand or control. On the federal side, you can imagine that the President and the Secretary of Defense feel a moral obligation to the taxpayers of the country for the, the legal, ethical, safe, and financially responsible re employment of federal forces. And, and so there's been this daylight in the past. And we've come to a closure on that by, uh, through a, an innovative piece that uh, I wish I had thought of. We just operationalized it called the dual status commander concept in which a National Guardsman from a state would have a dual chain of command, one through me to the Secretary and the President, and another through the Adjutant General of the state to the Governor, in which that one officer would have command of all of the federal response to a disaster in a state. And the way we've accomplished that is by properly training these individuals so that they not only understand their state response and they understand how the Guard works with all of the mutual supportive mechanisms that the National Guard has, such as the Emergency Management Assistance Compacts. But they also understand the federal side better than most federal people do. Uh, so now you have the person best positioned to command that response. And that has really taken us, as, as General McKinley pointed out, uh, a long way in our teamwork. Uh, and I'm very confident that this system will work. I don't want to have to try it anytime soon. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but if we do, uh, we've got a great partnership. And, and uh, our role at NORTHCOM is to be in support of FEMA and in support of the states. So that's actually a very hopeful statement of it, that if we have trouble in a future event, it should be because of capacity, not because we have capacity that we're unable to figure out how to use. So maybe that should be our standard, actually, uh, for performance. And one of the keys to that is the success of these three organizations in working together with working with other organizations. But another key to that's going to be the interface between the operational side and the political side. So let's turn to that. Uh, Congressman Stupak, you have uh, seen many of these events. You've been an elected official. You've looked at this also from the investigative side and the after action, looking at uh, events that have, have taken place in the past. Uh, as a political uh, and elected official, uh, how do you see the success of integration between the political oversight and the operational uh, command of these uh, events? Well, let me go back even a little further than that. I was also a law enforcement officer, so from a first responder in the 80s when there were tornadoes at Michigan, uh, we were mobilized Michigan State Police to go down there. And um, so by the time we get to the unified command and where the federal comes in, there's these first responders first. I think the communication and the coordination between the federal offices, even with the political side, is very, very good. But when you have a tornado or a flood, whatever it might be, um, or Hurricane Katrina, it's, it's the line officer, the first responders that are the ones that there is not the coordination. And I've been saying this for 18 years in Congress, but it goes back to 1978 with the Air Florida crash in Washington, D.C. There's no interoperability. If you're going to save lives and have the most impact upon a community immediately thereafter, you have to be able to communicate, talk to each other. We can do it after the fact, and they've got a great system here. But when that county sheriff is going there and can't talk to the local police officer or the county ambulance where to go to save some lives, we have to have interoperability. And believe me, every time there's a major incident, every president gets up and says, we're going to do interoperability. They've been saying it since 78, and it's still not done. So I mean, where we need the most coordination immediately to save lives, we are lacking. After that, the state and feds come in, and they do a fantastic job, and we all work together. Now, if you want to just look at um, uh, the Gulf oil spill, I, I think uh, Admiral Papp and others would comment on would tell me was, first thing we had to do is keep all the politicians out of there. <laughs> I, I mean, they were going down there all the time. People who had no jurisdiction on the issue yeah. were going down there all the time, and they wanted a free airplane ride out to see the you know, Deepwater Horizon. And, and I think also that, um, so they could come back and 
talk about it and back in their districts. And I think it put an bur unnecessary burden on the Coast Guard and the military and Department of Homeland Security trying to do that. I had the committee of the major jurisdiction. I was down there once, because <laughs> it's all you really needed if you really understood it. But that, that was a very complex one. And then I think politicians heighten the, um, we should be doing more, we should be doing this. I mean, the Gulf oil spill was unusual. It went on for months and months until we finally capped that well. And I'd go back home, and people would just expect the president to put on his scuba suit and go down and plug that oil spill. <laughs> but unrealistic expectation, but I think that comes from the political side, and demanding that things be done yeah. and not have a realistic understanding of the nature right. of the, of the uh, emergency we're dealing with. So even though we might agree, and I think a lot of people would, that, that the, the political influence in this case wasn't necessarily always functional, it isn't wasn't. that sort of an inevitable feature of these events, that the politicians feel like they have to be involved and have to be engaged? Is there anything we can uh, really do to manage that better? Yeah, yeah, especially when you get something like the oil spill that you, there's nothing you can do as an elected official. Let the experts do their job. Step back. So it's an education of the, it's, it's an education of the, of the of politicians. The politicians. Well, let's turn to Juliet on this issue because uh, as Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs, she was the, the principal person in the National Incident Command who was trying to handle the political relationships both between the Incident Command and the White House, uh, the Incident Command and DHS, and the Incident Command and five governors who happened to be of a different party than the President. Uh, so, Juliet, you must have seen some uh, political <laughs> issues in your, from that perspective. Yes. So say a little bit about how that looked from where you sat. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, a couple observations now a year later. I think uh, for all of you who will be working in the field that the um, term homeland is a really bad term for a variety of reasons, but I, I really think it's 50 homelands and a couple territorial homelands. And um, when you get a big event, uh, like the BP oil spill, you're, you're, let's say it's five states like the BP oil spill. It is essentially one event, but it's sort of five different uh, sort of uh, engagements depending on who's in charge in that state and who's in charge in that locality. And I think you have to be aware of that because the nuances will differ depending on um, uh, sort of you know, who's in charge in that state. And so understanding that political leadership, understanding what's animating them, um, their concerns, I, I spoke earlier today, the, the legacy of Hurricane Katrina uh, was, uh, the ghosts of Hurricane Katrina were right there on the BP oil spill. It was the same place. Uh, Alabama had a reaction to it that was related to, their, to, the, to how they felt the federal government treated them during Hurricane Katrina. So being aware of that, I think, is essential. And I mean, I come from the political side. I've worked with public safety operational components most of my career. Um, but um, it's not going away. And so m figuring out uh, how to utilize it to uh, uh, make the response better, um, I think that the White House um, getting uh, the escrow, the $20 billion escrow from BP was an important moment, not just for the people who were gonna be able to get claims from BP for that, but I think also a big political moment for the American public to say, wow, we are, uh, we're engaged, we're in charge, this is, this is and, and, and the government, all the governments care. So there are important roles uh, for the political beast, you know, elected beast, uh, elected officials who um, can represent people's concerns, uh, can, are elected to do that and elect to take leadership. And so I, I, I um, you know, you can get frustrated by politicians, you can understand maybe they have agendas that aren't entirely consistent with the entire operational components. Maybe they're trying to score points, uh, but also you, you'll waste a lot of energy thinking it's gonna go away. So I think one way to think about it is how do you um, manage it in a way, part of it is the training, the education, the um, explaining, and part of it is, under, is figuring out what role those elected officials might be able to play that can actually help you. Um, and I think, like, I think the, the escrow with BP was, was, was a moment in which I won't speak for the Coast Guard, but you could feel it if you were part of the National Incident Command. There was a, a sort of, it gave us some breathing space. It felt like a moment, even though it had nothing to do with the picking up the oil. Is there any specific advice you would give to someone who is going next to be in your position <laughs> about uh, what to do first, <laughs> uh, what to make sure you did or didn't do? Um, I think the, the uh, for me, the most important thing was I had a relationship 
not just uh, uh, with Admiral Papp and Admiral Allen, uh, but with a number of people within the Coast Guard, with, mm -hmm. with uh, General McKinley, um, uh, peop the, the people in charge of um, people who actually do the work. And I think uh, there are civilians in the audience and probably people who are thinking of running for office. I think it's really important to not uh, uh, view yourself as an expert, but just to view yourself as an expert in the thing that you know well. And I knew how to integrate or knew how to understand the local, state, federal interaction um, and to help the Coast Guard in that, in that regard. So that would be the first thing is, you know, don't sort of sit in this, in this cocoon and don't, so it's a lot of don'ts, but um, to understand uh, that uh, the, the, the locals will be the first responders. I don't, under law, the Coast Guard, the, the BP oil spill was, was unique in that sense. It sort of memorialized a, a, a federal response. And um, working with local and state officials, in particular local officials, who really are going to be the first on the ground, I mean, I think uh, is just so key uh, for, for people who work in the homeland, so to speak. And I, and I think that we, I personally probably waited too long, and you sort of woke up one day and realized, you know, the governors weren't the only players in the Gulf. I mean, everyone who watched TV knew the parish presidents, the county officials, the mayors, um, also needed uh, a, a lot of, needed to understand what was going on. And I told just a, a quick anecdote earlier. Um, the, what you have to understand is for elected officials who are responsible at the, ba at the ballot, they want, th their constituents turn to them. They're not necessarily turning to the tag or whoever else. They turn to them. And there was an incredible amount of embarrassment, I think, in the Gulf by the local officials that they couldn't answer a lot of questions. We got much better at getting that information down, the claims process, what the response looked like. The Coast Guard has strong ties with localities in the Gulf. But we have to remember that they're leaders, too. They're just leaders in a different world. And if we ignore it, they will turn against you in a heartbeat. So. Yeah. That's a great lesson for us here in Massachusetts because I think it came from here. Uh, so all large-scale events are political and all politics are local. Yeah. And yes, so right. start, start right. with that. Uh, that's a famous observation from here. Um, so let me, our, our, our panel I think has been hopeful about how we, uh, we are prepared and how we are going to be able to work together successfully. And we've set a standard now for performance, which is uh, only constrained by capacity. Uh, but let me ask you, what? What additional obstacles do you still see? What should we still be working on in a program like this with the people that you've uh, been generous to let us work with over the course of this week? What are the issues that we still should see as obstacles and should be trying to work on? Uh, any of you have a, a thought on that subject? Uh, Admiral Papp. Sure, Dutch. You know, we know how to do this. And we do this with regularity. And what I mean by that is um, my first experience in doing something like this was uh, in the early days of the department, we had a position called uh, Principal Federal Officials. Some of you will remember that title. We don't use it anymore. Uh, we used it for hurricanes. We used it for uh, national security events. And uh, early in my career as a flag officer, uh, I was up in the Great Lakes, our Ninth Coast Guard District, and I was assigned as the PFO for Super Bowl 40 in 2005. Well, major event. It's a low probability but high consequence event if something happens. And what do you do? Well, about a year in advance, we go up to Detroit and we start with the Detroit Police Department and the mayor's office and we start finding out what their needs are. We start building uh, partnerships, uh, pre-need relationships. Uh, this is the first time I actually worked with the National Guard because uh, I worked with the Michigan National Guard. and. Uh, and then we start bringing in the federal partners, and ultimately we end up with a huge security overlay and a very good security plan, including NORAD, because uh, they fly a cap over the Super Bowl. Uh, we were flying rotary wing air intercept. Pre-need relationships and plans, I think, are the key. Uh, so as I go back and I look at, uh, at the BP event, we had already established some pre-need relationships uh, Admiral Allen, and, I, and I'll, I'll give him credit for this one, uh, Department of Interior had set up meetings with the Department of Interior before this even came up. Uh, so the Secretary Salazar and he knew each other. Uh, we've started staff talks with the National Guard uh, Bureau, which uh, we just had our second annual staff talks. That's a pre-need relationship that we established. Uh, in a previous job of mine as the Atlantic Area Commander, uh, Admiral Winnefeld and his, uh, his predecessor, General Renuart, would invite us out for component commander 
conferences so that we all know each other. And in fact, uh, uh, my first hurricane conference was out there with uh, some of the people in the room here, the tags coming into NORTHCOM and being brought together. That is really the key, the, the, the relationships and getting them established early on. Then you need to take it that next step and, uh, and get into an exercise program, which unfortunately sometimes we build up a little complacency, mm -hmm. and then it's tough to get the key individuals into those exercises that you really need to have there, particularly senior elected le leaders. Very good, so that the obstacle is that we don't have enough of those relationships and we need to keep building them. Others, uh, Admiral Winnefeld or, or General Craig, have it General McKinley? I, if I were to choose three words, it would be uh, uh, preparedness, practice, and speed. Uh, and the preparedness side, I think we saw in Japan, even though there was sort of a black swan event, uh, low probability, high consequence, unanticipated combination of things, you still have to give the Japanese an awful lot of credit for their preparedness. Their, and that preparedness has led to an incredible resilience uh, among the Japanese people, not to mention their, their own sort of set of values and the way they, they live their lives. But there was a good lesson in there for us. And I believe that uh, our government is, is uh, going to be leaning more in the direction of building more preparedness, and I think that's a very good thing. It involves investments. It involves teaching the population how you need to be ready for one of these disasters that you can't predict, that sort of thing. And I would echo Admiral Papp in the practice piece, uh, the value of what uh, Craig McKinley and I did today, a, a major uh, a tabletop exercise, what we call a rock drill, uh, regarding the upcoming hurricane season, where we had the entire interagency there, National Guard, NORTHCOM, uh, Bill Carwile from FEMA was there, a very, very productive exercise uh, in uh, making sure that we're ready for the next potential hurricane. And then speed, uh, my saying is speed is life in this particular business. We have to get there quickly. We cannot uh, l allow bureaucracy to get in the way of moving the capability in, into place that will save lives uh, and uh, do all the other things that you need to do in the wake of a disaster. So again, preparedness, practice, and speed are the three words I would pick. The only thing I would add, it, it came up today in the rock drill. I think there's going to be a paralysis that may set in at the local uh, or the state or even the federal level due to a lack of resources or perceived lack of resources with a major event. Because we all know that hesitating will cost lives. We all know that practicing, exercising, training costs money. So if we, if we dry up the accounts that allow us to continue to build on top of these successes, it may create a paralysis that in the future due to the uh, the issues that Admiral Mullen talks about, our deficits are our number one national security issue. It also affects yeah. us locally too. So I, I would caution everybody that we as a nation are going to have to deal with the financial aspects and we can't shortchange the response to a major natural disaster or man-made disaster. This is actually a great question that I wanted to ask you as well. And I think uh, it would be great to get uh, Juliet's reflection on this as well. So, each of your agency, each of your commands, has multiple missions that you perform on a daily basis, which are daily, urgent, necessary things to do. So in the space of uh, recent years, we've seen enormous pressure on budgets to reduce costs, uh, yet your missions haven't changed. In fact, many cases have become more complex. And how do you, in that environment, find enough space to act in time? That is, to, to do things ahead of time, to prepare, to find space for preparation, instead of just being, having to deal with all the urgent uh, things that, that happen today, how do you carve out space for the, for the future events that are only a probability and aren't, aren't so urgent? <laughs> well, can I, well, can I actually <laughs> add something to this? Yeah. I, this? I, would, I would simply, uh, in, a, in a very short answer, and pa pass it off to my partners here, uh, we have to retain, and we are retaining, our capacity to plan. And, and I have a number of principal focus areas in my command that are the day-to-day -day things that you talk about, and we have a number of cross-cutting focus areas, and one of those is to look at unanticipated threats. You know, what's out there that uh, is lurking over the next hill that we need to plan for? It's not an easy job because it takes imagination and uh, discipline and time to try to think, think those things through. But think about a tsunami on the east coast of the mm -hmm. United States. What a potential disaster that would be. But we're, so we do spend a little bit of time looking at that and trying to plan for things like but that. But isn't it a struggle to find the resources to do that in the midst of all the press of the, the current things? Is the Congress prepared to support these kinds of resources? Yes, they have. They have um, <coughs> supported those resources, but it's been through the Department of Homeland mm -hmm. Security. If you take a look at uh, Hurricane Katrina, 57% of all the money 
allocate it went to Department of Homeland Security. So we don't necessarily look directly to the Coast Guard or the Army to take care of. We, we, here's our coordinating agency, and right. they're receiving the funds. But the other thing, Congress has also abused that. For instance, when I first went to Congress 18 years ago, my first 10 years, the emergency appropriation we do once a year was about 100, maybe 130 right. million dollars. Now it's billions, because they've used the emergency appropriations, real need of the country, the planning Mm, and part of the base load. response, and then they just load it up with all their pet projects and everything else. Mm. So now the emergency appropriations have become a Christmas tree, as opposed to being really focused on what it should be, which is emergency planning or taking care of a disaster that really did occur, but we put everything else in there. So I, we got to get back to that. Yeah, which, I think um, just two things here is I think one of the challenges, and you know, we're just a couple months uh, from the 10th anniversary of September 11th. Um, one of the challenges, and I know Secretary Napolitano, having been a governor and having and recognizing uh, now sort of uh, the need for a narrative of what happened to this nation and what we've been able to do and, and the progress that's been made, uh, recognized early on but that with this most recent election we have 30 plus new governors, um, let alone all the mayors. Uh, and uh, the only governor who is still um, a, a governor today and was governor on September 11th is Governor Perry from Texas. So when you just think of a narrative of what this le leadership outside of the federal government, when you think of a narrative about how, how people are elected, what their priorities are, I, I can't name a single governor who's, you know, their top 10 agenda items were Homeland Security. They, they can lose elections on it, but they're not winning elections on it. And so I think what's important, and, we, and the Secretary took seriously sort of um, reminding people of this narrative, it wasn't just about September 11th, it was about preparedness, planning, speed, everything else. I think it's important that we keep up that narrative and we don't have to constantly talk about September 11th because there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that folks respond to and terrorism is one piece of it. It may have instigated this conversation, but obviously there, there's a lot more to it. So, that's the first thing is to sort of keep up that that narrative and then secondly and this is just you know a recurring you know issue with with congress as well is um, prioritizing the expenditure of funds out in the state so when when congress gives us money it's going to support gives dhs money it supports operational components but most of it is to grants to state and locals and everyone knows that the risk assessment is often um, not obvious um, uh, to people. Why are we spending this much on, on people in the state and not this much? We need to be more transparent about it, give a narrative of why we're doing it. But we also, as a nation, and I think this is where, to be honest, I think Secretary Napolitano has been magnificent in this. It's just a, a little bit of sort of, um, you know, sort of realism about, uh, uh, you know, we, we have threats all the time, and we are going to do our darndest to stop terrorism and spills and whatever else, but also recognizing that uh, we also have to make sort of in, this, in these fiscal times really hard decisions about uh, preparedness and priorities. And I think talking more realistically about uh, we can't be all things to everyone, and we will have to prioritize and, and get those allocations uh, uh, to the states and localities, because the money is just even in the grant money, it's just significantly different. Eight years ago, I don't, I don't know what this state was getting, but we were getting a lot more than, than, uh, than I'm sure we're getting this year. So let me pick up on one other aspect of that, because we've talked a lot about the formal response, the, the uniformed response, the things that other organizations would do in the case of an event. But as we all well know, the first people who are gonna respond are gonna be the bystanders, and we're gonna be in support of them, and then eventually uh, helping as we, as we arrive. Um, but I wonder if you have reflections on the question of whether we've built up the public's resilience enough. We've talked about our own preparations, but have we got the public at a stage where they're doing the things that they need to do? And if, and, and if not, uh, what do you think we can do to try to improve the public as a partner, if you will, uh, to help build the nation's resilience? Uh, comments or thoughts on that question from, from our panel? I, I would say my initial response is no, we haven't done enough, but uh, part of that is uh, an issue that constantly bothers me, and that's the issue of complacency. Uh, I used to keep a clock on my desk which uh, reflected the number of days that, uh, uh, that transpired between the, the uh, bombing in the uh, parking garage of the World Trade Center in 93 to September 11, 2001, and, uh, and 
when I was doing speeches during that period, I would constantly use that and talk about complacency. And I could see it in the crowds that I spoke to. You could see the nonverbals. Uh, the further you got away from 9-11, you could, you could see the nonverbals in the audience. The eyes would roll back. Uh, if you, we were to talk about an earthquake exercise uh, six months ago, we would probably get uh, the, the same response. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of attention to the national level exercise this year for some reason. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I, my understanding is Secretary Napolitano and the President are going to take part in the exercise this time. Uh, so part of it is, you know, we, we tend to develop plans and exercises to, feed, to, to fight the last battle that we did. And that's sort of okay because there are probably things that we pick up that are translatable to a different version of the next crisis. But, but the, the, the thing that really does bother me the most is complacency that this society seems to, uh, to allow to creep in very quickly, short attention span. I also think, Dutch, that uh, the asymmetry that is uh, facing the world today that is not traditional, it's not state-sponsored, it's nothing that we grew up studying or learning. Uh, is an issue of concern that the next event will be something we haven't thought about mm -hmm. or that we aren't prepared for. That is something that I think our, our citizenry needs to be aware of and cognizant of. This is a new world and this uh, century will be different than the last. And for many of us in these front rows, we learned and emulated a different era mm -hmm. and that era is gone. Mm -hmm. I would only add uh, briefly that uh, FEMA Administrator Craig Fugate has kind of an intriguing idea in this area and that we have a, a tendency to sort of default to the, well, the response is going to be a uniform response, whether it's first responders, police, fire department, medical, wearing smocks, whatever, or National Guard, military. But in fact, he's, he has recognized that in a real disaster like that, there are going to be plenty of able-bodied Americans running around that survived who want to help. And so he's encouraged the whole enter enterprise, as it were, to make sure that we enlist those people into the effort. Now, there's going to be interesting legal ramifications there, you know, if one of them gets yes. hurt and all that kind of stuff. But these people are going to be around, and they're going to want to help, so why not use them? And so I applaud Craig for uh, having that sort of an approach. So that expands the array of people who might be involved and, and that we might bring in. And there's some efforts to train people, actually, at the local level to be more effective in that role. But there's also a political issue here. Uh, is it safe for politicians to say, that we have to be ready for strikes on the homeland, for, uh, for events that might happen, that, that the government's not necessarily going to completely protect you. Uh, is there the political will to, uh, to tell the public that they need to be prepared? Oh, yes, and I think the public wants to play a role, but they also want to be constructive and not be mm -hmm. causing problems. I mean, Hurricane Katrina, dentists who wanted to help out, and, and we think of dentists, okay, but they're <laughs> medical doctors too. But they were denied the opportunity to help out because they weren't licensed in the state of Louisiana. Uh, that was sort of, but uh, when something happens, uh, our offices get deluged with doctors or, or people who want to give clothing in it. I mean, that, that's, that's a great one that everyone dumps their closets out on us. And how, how do you coordinate that? How do you make sure you're really doing it meaningful? And then if you say, no, you can't fly your plane to Haiti uh, with the earthquake, then they get mad at you, like, well, I should be able to. Well, we just can't have everyone flying an airplane <laughs> in Haiti. I mean, the island's not big enough. So they want to help. They don't know how to direct it. And I, I, I'm glad to hear that we're having good discussions with that with FEMA, because I think there are some ground rules we could establish that they really could be very, very helpful. So uh, Tom Ridge famously made the observation that in order to protect themselves against a possible radiological event, Americans should buy polyethylene and duct tape. <laughs> And that was actually a pretty good idea from a technical perspective. That would actually save lives if people actually did that. He was laughed off the, the national stage for saying that. The politics would not support a national level figure saying mm -hmm. people have to be prepared. Are we in a different position today, Juliet, from what you saw where you were in? I think so. I mean, I quoted a different Secretary of Homeland Security, the second one, Michael <laughs> Chernoff, who I thought he got uh, criticized for this as well. And he said, not every bridge is a bridge. Um, uh, you know, and he meant, you know, for the Department of Homeland Security. There's lots of bridges in the country. And then there's bridges, as we've seen with the WikiLeaks. I guess I'm allowed to talk about WikiLeaks because I'm not in government anymore, but with that, that there was a focus on uh, the Brooklyn uh, Bridge. And so um, I think maybe between the two of them, um, there is some space. And, and as I said, I think uh, uh, this, you know, this administration has had real 
uh, attempted terrorist attacks, I mean, real ones, and very close, as we saw uh, several times. And I think that there is, there, they've, you know, Secretary Napolitano and the White House and, and the way that the interagency is talking about it is different. I think it's, it's uh, and maybe that's the benefit of them not being successful and the benefit of time, but is to uh, um, uh, not sort of be all fearful all the time, mm -hmm. but to be realistic and that we're doing what we can and, um, uh, and uh, to, to stop it and, uh, and to try to uh, protect ourselves. So, uh, but, you know, it's a very hard space and I will, uh, nothing gets me sort of, you know, more worked up, lots of things get me worked up, but I think uh, the, the fact that able-bodied Americans with means um, somehow don't think it's their responsibility, it's like vaccinations in my mind, it's to sort of make sure that they take care of themselves and their families because then these folks, when something bad happens, can take care of the people who, who either are in immediate harm's way or, uh, or can't, couldn't help themselves. Um, is, uh, you know, sort of, um, I think in some ways a sad statement about mm. um, our, our notion of what it is to be a, a citizen. So um, I, I think we're beginning to find that space where we can talk about this a little bit more realistically. Great. Well, we could continue this conversation for a long time and very, uh, to very good effect, I'm sure. But I want to turn now to uh, questions from the audience. Um, so we have for this purpose uh, microphones in the audience. So if you would like to ask a question, please come and array yourself uh, near one of those microphones. And let me just remind you as you are doing that, there are four of them. There are two on the floor here and two up on the, on the uh, alcoves. Uh, let me just remind you what a question is. A question begins <laughs> with a statement of who you are, uh, your name and your uh, sort of general affiliation in the, in the community here. Uh, and second, a question is a short collection of words with a question mark at the end, okay? And questions come in ones, okay? They don't come in multiples, uh, they come in ones, and then we'll have the, the, uh, some interaction with our, our group. So if you'd like to, 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 make a, uh, to ask a question, please come to one of our microphones and, and uh, uh, let us know what your question is. Please. Hi, thank you all for being here and thank you for your service. My name is Samantha Silverberg. I'm a master's student at the Kennedy School, and I'm actually also one of Professor Leonard's students. Um, Congressman Stupak spoke about interoperability. Uh, I'm interested in human interoperability. How do you all ensure that uh, members of the Guard, members of the Coast Guard, or active duty service members can speak the same lang language as first responders, since that's most likely the people they'll be working with? I'll take part of that. If Please. I may. Yeah. Uh, first, I uh, Samantha, thank you for your question. Uh, towards the end of your statement, you said, as first responders. And I would just want to remind everybody that the real first responders, and I think the real heroes in this country, uh, in, in the homeland, as it were, are our firemen and our policemen. Mm -hmm. They are the real first responders, along with all the great, brave citizens that are out there helping their fellow citizens. And, you know, we, we joke sometimes, but it's true that the most, uh, uh, the best intelligence we have on terrorism is, is citizens finding bombers in Times Square and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. So I just want to make that very tiny correction. But we do work very hard at being interoperable. And I'll give you an example. One of my responsibilities at NORTHCOM is to maintain a federal force that can respond in the wake of a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear event. Uh, the National Guard also has considerable capacity and is growing more capacity uh, in its ability to respond to the same kind of events. So what happens when we both show up? at a large event, are we gonna to work well together? And the answer is yes, because we train together. Uh, we we uh, work together uh, in each other's certification exercises. Uh, we actually do these certification exercises together sometimes, and that lends great interoperability to that kind of a response. Uh, there are an, a host of other ways in which we, become, we are interoperable. We, have, we actually have radios that can talk to each other now. We have uh, radio systems where you can plug uh, one type of radio into one end of it and another type of radio into the other end of it and now you can, everybody can talk to everybody else. So we work very hard on this problem. Are we going to be perfect in the next disaster? Of course not. We are going to make mistakes. But we have this in mind and we're making a lot of progress in that area. It's a good question. Very good. Other, other comments uh, you'd like to I would just say that the uh, gentleman and we have two uh, female tags in the states uh, do this every day. They work with their first responders. Many of them are policemen or firemen. Uh, Adjutant General of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was a policeman and very proud of it. 
And so having that connection to the local community makes the National Guard uh, adaptable as the Coast Guard and the United States Navy and our other services are, but that's the uniqueness of the National Guard is community-based, uh, training, working together, and following under the mayors and the local community leaders. But the point, the point I was trying to make, though, as they said, firefighters, and law enforcement officers, they're not interoperable. We've spent over $300 million just in Washington, D.C., and it's still not interoperable because of the challenges you have with the subways and with the tall buildings. So if something really happens and you're trying to save lives, in the first few hours, that's when you save them, the locals cannot talk to each other. When the National Guard comes in, maybe the state police, you might be able to get enough radios out then. But until that time, you can't talk to each other. And we've been talking about that since 1978 in this country. And it's ridiculous we cannot do it. When Hurricane Katrina hit, there were four satellite phones down in the Gulf. Four. I mean, we're still doing it the old way. Hey, Joe, what do you think? That's our interoperability today. <coughs> and with our technology and our telecommunications, there is no excuse for it other than a lack of will. Four satellite phones and three of them were probably CNN phones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please, to our next question. I'm Dr. Cheryl Seminara, and I work in the Office of the Chief Learning Officer at DHS Headquarters. And so I'm very honored to be part of this program and want to thank you all for being here. The main thing, this is the question part. The main <laughs> theme that we're hearing is interagency collaboration. And one of the things as I sit back and look uh, my big two years with the department, is national security professional development has been on a strategic pause. And what we're hearing now is it's gonna go back to the departments to do their own thing. How, isn't that a little counterintuitive to what we're talking about and what we're trying to succeed in doing? That's for you. Is it? Because I don't know much about it. <laughs> I, re I really can't answer the substance of that question. I mean, I, I obviously, um, I, I felt like I was barely at the Department of Homeland Security because of all the interagency uh, collaboration that was going on. I mean, we, we didn't speak about the Council of Governors specifically with Craig Fugate and, and Secretary Napolitano and, and others, but that's an interagency uh, led by Secretary Gates uh, initiative to bring uh, governors uh, to get them to understand, talk about interoperability, to get them to understand uh, the Pentagon and the, and, the, mm -hmm. and the Homeland Security apparatus uh, that would uh, exist and to hear from them about some of their concerns. So um, can't answer the specifics of it, but I think that there is actually a, a tremendous amount of activity um, on the interagency and the intergovernmental, which is as important when you're dealing with the homeland. It's just significantly different than when you're talking about a war abroad. Um, that actually makes me very optimistic. I, I can just say on behalf of the adjutants general that, that we are uh, working, training, uh, speaking to, liaisoning with our counterparts more than we've ever done before and getting a rich return for that investment. And so it, it may be counterintuitive if we go back to, to where you make your uh, supposition, but I think, I think we're going to be continually challenged to do more together. And the days of doing it alone are, yeah. are far behind us. You know, one of the principles that we talk about in emergency management is the, the idea that if you train for something that you only do rarely, you probably won't be as good at it as if you train in a way that involves things you do every day. So for example, we say if you're going to use incident management, you should use it on all of your events so that when you have a really big event you really need it, you've got it available to you. What that would suggest in this domain is that you shouldn't just be training for that big event that you're all gonna, this is gonna bring you all together. But are there other ways in which your daily missions are interacting with one another that bring you more naturally into contact with each other on a, on a daily basis across your agencies? I would say for one thing that uh, at NORTHCOM, I am utterly dependent upon the National Guard to execute my mission. Uh, the Air Sovereignty Alert mission in which we try to prevent another 911 type event in CONUS, it's flown by the Air National Guard. As the uh, missile defense trigger puller for the country, those missions are carried out by the Alaska and Colorado National Guard for me. And we have a host of other areas in which we work together every day, and I have around 45 permanently assigned National Guardsmen in my headquarters. Uh, there's a robust exchange program where um, uh, the Guard will send 
uh, one-star officers in every now and then to take the place of one of my one-stars who has to go do a capstone class or something like that. So there's a, there's a rich cross-flow of people, mm -hmm. I think, uh, and at least in my headquarters that I'm very happy to have. I know, Admiral Papp, that the Coast Guard works with everybody all the time. That's the nature of your work. Yeah. Well, it, it is, exactly. Uh, in fact, one of the things all of us in the Coast Guard like to say is uh, one of our core competencies is that we're bureaucratically multilingual. <laughs> and uh, and, and there's, there's some truth to it. Uh, we, I go with regularity over to the tank and meet with the Joint Chiefs. That's a privilege that I get along with uh, Craig. Uh, but uh, we also meet with the Department of Justice. We meet with uh, EPA. Uh, Department of Interior, uh, we work our way across the entire government, and that's just at the strategic level in Washington. When you work it down to where, really where the service delivery point is, which is with our sectors, about, about 42 sectors right now that divide up the country uh, with captains, 06s in charge, uh, they wear about five hats uh, that are statutory based. And uh, two of the things that they do, it started out as uh, port safety committees which brings together the federal, state, and local, and industry, uh, originally to deal with safety issues in the port. Uh, it carried on under the National Contingency Plan to come up with area contingency plans for pollution response. And then after 9-11, it developed into area maritime security committees as well. We bring all those partners together on a daily basis, and that's really where the first action is gonna start at the sector level. And, uh, and I think we're doing a good job in bringing those people together and understanding each other. I think the issue that you're speaking to is one of the, the reasons why we were excited about the opportunity to do this program. Because we think the natural skills and development and leadership capabilities of these three commands are likely to be the best uh, answer the nation can give to the question of where you get that kind of leadership. And precisely for the reason that you gave, because your daily work requires that. Uh, so that, that I think is, is uh, what's exciting about building that national asset. Let's come to the microphone on this side. Thank you. Uh, my name's Colonel Grab from the U.S. Army Reserve, and I have a question in regards to the dual status commander mm -hmm. proof of concept. Uh, given that dual status command has only probably happened a couple times, I think here in Mass for the Democratic National Convention, and I think maybe in the Olympics in Atlanta, it really hasn't been proved out for a major response exercise. So are there plans in place for the major exercises that you have coming up to try to prove that as a proof of concept, and how will it really work in the context of the federal defense coordinating officer that exists in each FEMA region? First of all, I think we've done it around seven times, uh, di different national security special events. Uh, the lion's share of the time it's been a National Guard officer as the uh, dual status commander, but for the Boy Scout Jamboree this year, it was a, a federal officer that was sworn into the Virginia National Guard. Uh, for a two-week period, and actually uh, we had 50,000 wonderful Boy Scouts in one place at one time with their 15,000 scout leaders. <laughs> you want to learn how to run a refugee camp? <laughs> 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 they all show up at one day, uh, and it worked out very, very well. So we've designed the program, first of all, to make sure that there's robust training for the officer that's going to be the dual status commander. That's very important so that they understand the federal side as well as the state side. We also give them a Title X, a federal deputy, in the event of one of these disasters so that they can have that kind of support on their staff. They use that deputy any way they want to. I don't try to tell them how to use the deputy, uh, but that's a very useful thing. We also uh, will provide them with what we call a joint support force staff element, which is a group of federal officers that will augment the uh, dual status commander's staff in any way the dual status commander would like. Uh, but to provide additional capacity in the event of a disaster, but also some federal expertise, in, including legal expertise, to make sure that the forces are used properly. And then we do plan to exercise it. We've already done it with several of the states. I know that Florida and Texas and North Dakota have exercised it. And then in the upcoming national, leader, uh, national level exercise, we have the new Madrid earthquake scenario. I believe at least three states are going to exercise the contingency mm -hmm. dual status commander concept there. So we're growing this thing. It's very encouraging. Uh, the response that we've gotten from the Guard, it's a, it's a, you know, a very synergistic concept. Now, the real test will come when we have a major disaster and we need to do this. But uh, I'm very confident that we will provide the proper support to that dual status commander, that they will be properly trained, uh, and that uh, if and when federal forces are asked for by the state through FEMA to us, then we will provide them and they will work for that dual status commander. And I, I'm confident it's going to work well. 
There's a world of difference between that description and the one we would have had to give 10 years ago about Absolutely. the way in which these agencies knew each other. Well, don't and, you know how we got there is the adjutants general on behalf of their governors decided this was in their interest. Right. There was negotiation, there was give and there was take, and we're now to a point where we can actually work it. That wouldn't have happened 10 years ago more than likely. No, I think that's exactly right. And basically people heard that message and have been gradually doing things that involve uh, remediating those problems, getting, you know, getting those relationships built. And, and I just think that's enormously encouraging. So uh, let's go to the microphone on the left here. My name is uh, Chief Warrant Officer 3, Tim Laval, currently serving with the uh, Massachusetts Army National Guard. And, Be careful, uh, your boss is in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of bosses in this room. <laughs> <laughs> so it is. Yeah. A lot of what we've heard about tonight is, uh, is information management. We've heard about how the, the ghost of Katrina you know, influenced the BP spill, how we have to uh, deal with the media, uh, outreach overlay. Um, we've heard things like, uh, Oh, how we have to establish relationships and things before events. It sounds like a, uh, something that's crying out for a, a uh, concerted information operations. But my question is, could you, could you speak to uh, how we are beginning to deal with the, the, the power of the, the emerging um, social media and uh, how we can use that in our uh, response and, and more particularly use that in our education that we're going to be doing? Great question. Okay. Uh, well, I, Don't I mean, look at me. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, so I think, uh, and I discussed this in the earlier class, I think um, there's, so, what I was sort of shocked at, and those of you who have gone through a big response before, is just the amount of information that is just uh, being requested, demanded, uh, being generated by the operational folks. And uh, one of the lessons uh, we learned um, in, in the BP spill was that uh, in some ways, we needed a, a, there was an insatiable appetite for information um, by uh, the, the, the political figures, but also because also their uh, public. We needed a better way to uh, translate. Someone talked about interoperability. You didn't mention civilians in that. That to translate this really sometimes detailed, highly technical flow rate, you know, loop current, all sorts of words that really meant nothing to people who weren't in, in the incident command. So we need the translation from the operations to the public. Um, I think the, the government is, if FEMA in particular, uh, 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 DHS is, is util and also local and states are utilizing social media in ways that are uh, very helpful using Google Maps and other things in, in ways that are helpful where, you know, where should you go. Um, and so we've gotten, uh, uh, I don't know what the numbers are, but much more sophisticated in that regard. What we can't counter is reality being set by social media. Um, and I just don't, as I said, you know, you can bang your head against a wall until it's sort of your fault that you're still banging it. I mean, what, all you can do is uh, try to get a louder message out there um, because it's here to stay and it can be very helpful if you know how to utilize it. Um, and we're getting, I think, much better about learning how to utilize it. I, I think that's one of the first things a public affairs team has to do yeah. now is set up a web page mm -hmm. uh, for people to go to. And, and I was not a believer in this uh, back a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, but, and a slow learner in regards to this as well. And lots of times what I'll judge is the activity based upon if you've got a, a blog portion of it and responding to questions. Sometimes you won't see that many and you'll think, well, this is not being read very much. But then when you actually start counting the hits, that are on there, and they're in the thousands or hundreds of thousands. Uh, what that tells me is they're coming in there, they're getting their information load, they don't need to comment, mm -hmm. and you're getting ahead of the, uh, in fact, what I've determined is the fewer uh, responses yeah. on the blog portion of it, the better the job that we're doing. So I, it has to be a key component of your messaging, that external outreach that I was talking about in the first question. Can I, can I add to that, because I think with the Gulf, um, website, um, Deepwater Horizon, uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting which website it was, but I think uh, one of the key aspects of government in an emergency is transparency. Um, we were criticized in, in, in the oil spill about that, Japan's being criticized about their transparency and collusion with the nuclear industry, whatever it's gonna be. The
there's always going to be suspicion when people are dying or are threatened. And I think that the social media and these websites went really far. You, if you saw what we were putting on there, first of all, I mean, half of it would interest no one. But we just felt like, you know, and, and our press officer felt like we need to put it out there because it's information that maybe scientists are using. And then they can tell a narrative that's helpful to us or environmentalists are using. And they can tell a narrative. So, uh, pushing more sort of against uh, a lot of people's inclination, but pushing more out there in terms of sort of basic facts lets people maybe tell a story that's harder for you to tell because you're the government and so everyone thinks that you have an agenda um, is really is really key. I think there's another, another phenomenon there. Um, not only can regular media and social media be used as a, as a mechanism to inform people uh, whether it's to put context of, you know, the radiation exposure you're getting is the same as a, a dental x-ray or something like that. But we're also exploring the notion of using it as a sensory mechanism for ourselves. So if somebody's out there and they have a, a mechanism through social media of saying, hey, you know, there's a crowd at 32nd and F Street and they're hurting for water, somebody get some water out here, we can digest that inside a headquarters and potentially get some water there a lot more quickly than we ordinarily would. Um, and so I think there's some and the same thing with regular media. You know, if, if Anderson Cooper's out there and he says, hey, I'm standing on this street corner and there people need water here, are we going to ignore it? Of course not. So we're, we'll use any information we can get, and social media are a potential sensor for us. And the commanding general of the District of Columbia Guard used it in the inauguration. He used a lot of uh, technology that we didn't have four years before that for crowd control, for response, for fire and police. So, Errol, I commend you and the team for putting that together. And it was really the whole FEMA Region 3 guys who did that and gals. Very good. Next question, please. Good evening, and again, thank you all for coming. I, uh, Mike Hussey, I work for the MITRE Corporation, and I had the privilege uh, just after 9-11 of serving with Mythic Land on a dam neck on behalf of Fleet Forces. And Admiral, I spent four weeks underway with you on the Mount Whitney for Austria Challenge. Julian, I think this question is for you. I like your idea of the 50 homeland areas, how you break it up. And the, you know, we're all members of DOD, DHS, but the non government organizations, the civil authorities, play a crucial role when you're dealing with a crisis or a consequence. And what's the level of engagement? Is the infrastructure there? When you have an incident, are you able to tap into the fusion centers for the states? Um, here in Massachusetts, we've got the Commonwealth Fusion Center in Maine. We've got the Boston Regional Intel Center in Boston. That's where the heart and soul is, really, for the first responder and the public safety community. And those people have a real strong relationship across the state. So just throwing that out there for you, ma'am, if, if you could kind of explain how you engage yeah, so uh, for those who don't know, the, um, uh, the uh, department works in each of the states, plus some, as you mentioned, Boston and Massachusetts have uh, these entities called the fusion centers who uh, are utilized, uh, basically, fusion to synthesize inf all the vast amounts of information and intelligence that are coming out and provide it, or in, in the best case scenario, provide information to first responders that is relevant um, helpful to them rather than just sort of, you know, vague and, and, and unhelpful, to be honest. And also to provide information up to the federal government because, was, as was noted, that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially com a lot of communities that are seeing what's going on. And I think, uh, uh, so, and they are utilized by the department uh, extensively. I mean, you don't have to uh, hear too many speeches by Secretary Napolitano. This is one of her core missions because uh, essentially, uh, there is no benefit to having a huge federal intelligence or law enforcement apparatus if it's irrelevant to uh, to the states and locals. And we were so far away from uh, unity of effort in that regard on September 11th and uh, getting so much closer now. So we would utilize uh, the, uh, the fusion centers, I think, in the Commonwealth and, and uh, under Secretary uh, Kurt Schwartz is here uh, from Massachusetts. I think we had a National Guard member in the Commonwealth Fusion Center uh, for some time to provide that that um, that unity of sort of uh, of information. And so I I think it's a very good news story. Um, and there's lots and you know as well as um, it's a lot more matured in terms of the legal requirements, the privacy requirements, and and other things that are important to citizens of the United States. I think. These folks have the heart 
one of our jobs because it is the homeland, right? It is not just 50 states. It is domestic issues um, that are make this country great about the constitutional norms that we want to protect and the privacy, uh, but make it so different than um, uh, you know theater of operations sort of abroad. And uh, and they're struggling with that. You know they they have those challenges every day, and then multiply that by 50, and then just think of all the cities we haven't talked about where each of those players are huge players. They are they are uh, uh, the leaders of their cities and urban areas. So. So I'm hearing a lot in our discussion that we've made a lot of progress in figuring out from an operational perspective how to make both individual organizations more effective and then how to make them able to network and to be more effective with partner organizations. And you guys are working on that all the time in your daily missions and as well as in the uh, thinking about a large event that might come down the road. I'm hearing less about the other intrinsic difficulty that we've pointed to, which is this problem of what kind of political oversight there is of these operational issues. And I just think, looking at the BP example, <laughs> it's not hard to see that a lot of the issues were in that interface between the politics and the operations. And we haven't solved this problem in, until we've begun to, to develop a real doctrine in that area. So any thoughts or insights about how we can make progress on that, on that issue, or are we just gonna muddle our way through the next one too? You know, the Pentagon, periodically, probably about three or four times a year, have an exercise where elected officials are invited. In fact, they're encouraged to attend, uh, but very few members do it. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's early in the morning, number one. <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> Military time. Cultural problem. Uh, I know. <laughs> but uh, it's early in the morning, but there they really stress, okay, well, why do you need to know this information? Mm -hmm. What is important for you to tell your constituents? Tell us what needs to be done. And I've done the exercise many times, and, and it's been very, very good but it's usually centered on just a few committees and not all mm -hmm. the committees in the Congress, which I think makes it very difficult then. If I'm on the Ag Committee and I um, want to know about the BP oil spill, uh, there, there's no connection there's there. There's no way to, to yeah. do that. I mean, some of that is, I think, congressional and Senate leadership saying to the members, do it. this is, yeah, do it, and also this is crazy. Why are we doing eight congressional visits to, to the <clears> Gulf <throat> in one week? And you know, part of that is, you know, sort of, control of all the membership. I'm, I'm definitely uh, 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 of, of the mind that um, what we love about this country is also what can drive us crazy about this country in a crisis, which is both are going to exist side by side. And I think we learned some lessons from BP about how to uh, uh, do better uh, as from the department's perspective in terms of uh, working with state and locals, uh, providing information in a timely manner, and not just timely, but in a relevant, like in a way that people actually understand it, right? That, it, that it's in English, so to speak. And, uh, and to uh, realize that any crisis is gonna have these parallel tracks rather than sort of saying, well, we're in charge because it's operational, um, and, or the politicians saying we're in charge because I'm the governor or mayor of the state, and figure out a way in which uh, they can actually help each other. As I said earlier, I think uh, the White House uh, interactions with BP, which were uh, uh, very different than what was happening in the Unified Command with BP, which was everyone was working together, uh, uh, really did create some, some helpful space, I think, as, as Admiral Papp said, the appointment of Admiral Allen, so that you had one voice, you didn't have these inconsistent voices, uh, was really important to sort of portray uh, uh, to have grip and portray grip, which is a key component of leadership. Uh, so I think that that um, may not be the best words for people who are actually out in the field, but uh, it's, it's, it's what uh, makes uh, the working in this arena so dynamic as well, and that they're just going to both exist. They're not going away. Well, not to make too fine a point of it, though, I think uh, uh, a neutral observer might say, that the operational response to the BP oil spill was a lot better than it was given credit for. And one of the reasons it wasn't given as much credit as it was probably due was that there was all this political infighting about it, back and forth across different jurisdictions and between different levels of government and between Republicans and Democrats. And, and so to say that we, don't, we haven't got a worked out strategy for how we deal with that, where these guys are working every day on trying to right. work out how the operational strategy comes together. One more on that, I'd call it political, but it's really, in a way, academia. I mean, they call us all the time when something happens. Mm -hmm. They can't call the Coast Guard. They can't pick up the phone or part of Homeland Security, but they all know they're a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. So they'll call me up and say, you know, you know on the flow rate, of, yeah. of the, that was pushed because our committee pushed it because there's no, that flow rate was totally wrong. Secondly, BP wasn't telling us. 
thirdly, there were cameras that they weren't letting us see. So, I mean, academia, the professors, and then they call us all the time, and they'll say, hey, this, you're totally off here, because here's what's going on. So, I mean, we're getting pushed a little bit, too, to get more information, more of that transparency, right. which then we start asking questions, and then, oh, boy. Yeah. And then it really gets un yeah. unwind. <laughs> but you guys share some responsibility. Well, thank too. you, I think. <laughs> uh, That's, that was his it's point. Just, just oh, our, just really our attempted that. inquiry, right, <laughs> just, trying to, just trying to find out what's Help going on. But it does feel to me like this is an area, and I think this was part of the reason that we thought this program was important to do, that we need to evolve a more successful way of, of handling these large-scale events in all respects, in respect to integrating the operational response, but also in terms of figuring out how to get the political oversight to work in a way that's more functional and, and, and less, less and, problematic. And just finally, I mean, to your point when you asked, before you get next, before, when you asked, are we, is the American public ready for that conversation? We were talking about terrorism at the time. I mean, uh, you know, was the American public prepared to see oil on shore? No. Did everyone who was working the spill know oil would hit shore? Yes. Uh, there was just a gap between the American public sort of zero tolerance um, and the fact that oil was going to hit shore. It was a huge oil spill. And the fact so little oil hit shore is the good news story. Uh, but it's very hard to tell that when there's a picture every day of the same pelican. I'm telling you, same pelican. It was. <laughs> they admit it now. I just had to get that point in. But then what do we do about that? <laughs> so one thing we could do about that is say, that's just the status of life and we just have to put up with it. There's nothing we can do. But maybe there is something we can do to try to shift. Maybe we educate the public better, or maybe we, what, what, what do we do? Any thoughts on the panel about how to, how to shift that, that dialogue in the public and between the yeah, public and us? You know, Russ Honore, after he left service, and, and all of us know him because he's a larger than life uh, person, went to work for the Red Cross, and Russ is out there on the, on the circuit trying to get families just to have a, um, a weather radio, a radio, to have a plan for their children to rally at a point. And, and Russ will tell you that there's just not a lot of receptivity to this type of planning. So that's the dilemma. We can't, we can't give up. We have to keep dealing with it, but it's, it's just not resounding uh, with the public right yet. So we need political leadership to help us to, to accomplish sure, that. Yeah. Sure. And, and that's something we still, that's, that's an as yet to be solved problem. Please, so. Hi, I am Camila Chavez Cortez, and I'm an artist and a photographer and a painter, and I have painted a pelican. <laughs> and uh, um, so I really want to know, and I have painted the uh, deep border horizon. Mm -hmm. So I really want to know what kind of policies can we establish in the future to deal with the ecological after effects of these tragedies? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the Coast Guard also works with the EPA on this, and I think, I, I actually think that, that if you, the, a lot of those policies are in place. I mean, from the beginning, on the restoration side, part of the 20 billion they got from BP uh, is going to long-term restoration and ecological restoration and the study of what in fact happened, in particular to the marshland. So part of the legal structure that is quite complicated in terms of the Oil Pollution Act, part of the legal structure envisions a long-term restoration part, and that's why uh, this story has not ended. One is, we don't know two or three or four years from now what's gonna show up on shore. Um, we don't know what won't grow next season, um, and we don't know uh, continuous studies of the fisheries, of course, but also the, the quantity of dispersants that were used. But I turn to Admiral Papp as well, is that the, eco the environmental side is part of the way the Coast Guard thinks about. Well, it is, but uh, prevention is really <laughs> the, uh, the key to yeah. all this, and uh, the lessons that we learned both from uh, deep, I mean, I don't know how many people in the room, and I'll admit that I'm one who did not know what a blowout preventer was before all this started, at least uh, the intricacies of how one works. Uh, we're going to have to review on how these things were approved, uh, the, the response plans. Uh, there are things like the National Pollution, uh, Pollution Fund, uh, which has a cap on the liability that a, that a company has to pay. We need to get that adjusted for inflation and a lot of other things. We were fortunate that we had a company like BP that was willing, with a little incentive, to put up the $20 billion, uh, because uh, there was a limit to their liability. They, they could have walked away from this thing. Uh, that wouldn't have done them very good in the media, but they, they could have. But there are a lot of smaller companies that are out there as well that perhaps could not afford this type of response. So uh, 
what do we need to do? Well, we need to make sure we raise the liability cap so there's an incentive for people to do better in terms of safety. And we're going to have to put a, a little bit more regulation in there as well, both from the Department of the Interior and probably the Coast Guard in terms of response plans. And uh, we're also ha going to have to come up with uh, some better division of uh, between the federal government and industry on maintenance of equipment because the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 really put all the responsibility on industry to maintain the technology and the inventory of equipment to respond to something like this. At the end of the day, the only thing that was owned by the federal government were 16 Coast Guard buoy tenders who we had the foresight to uh, build skimming capability into, but those were the only federal resources that were available. Yeah, well, I think still I'm there's sorry. an issue between what is scientific and what is legal. And, you know, we, we know some of the after effects of the Valdez issue so mm -hmm. I think that you know the field is open on why to really be fair about it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I'm unfortunately going to have to bring our discussion now to a close. Um, I think we've had a really interesting and engaged discussion about the some of these really important and uh, continually vexing issues but on the other hand we've got a lot of very hopeful messages in tonight's discussion so I'm going to ask each of our panelists to uh, give each of them an opportunity to say one final thing to a group of <laughs> assembled officials who will uh, be among the people who lead us through the next uh, event. Uh, what would you tell us about what we should continue to work on? Uh, there are faculty here who are working with the program and the people in the program. Uh, what, what should we continue to address? What do you see as the thing that we can continue to invest in that will, will help us to improve here? Um, and Melina why don't we start with you? In terms of investments, uh, what I mentioned uh, earlier was the preparedness piece, uh, making the right investments for first responders and, and the public and that sort of thing to make sure that we are at least as resilient as the Japanese people were. Um, but I also think there's a, a cultural piece that we're making an awful lot of progress on. And, and you know, to summarize it in a colloquialism, it's sort of checking our ego at the door when something like this happens and making sure that we're, uh, we're able to set our institutional biases aside and work together for a common purpose, uh, knowing who is supported and who is supporting, and then getting on with the problem. And I think that's, that's one of the most important things, but one of the hardest things to do, but I think we're on a good track right now. Excellent. Admiral Papp. Uh, I would say for this group uh, that remember the credibility that a uniform brings uh, to events like this. Uh, there's a reason why you saw a lot of uniformed Coast Guard people being put out in front of the microphones and the cameras. Uh, what I have concerns about is uh, that that does not develop into messaging and partic particularly political messaging because then we put our credibility at, at risk. And there were times when uh, there were people being pushed in that direction and, and we needed to work against that. Uh, Admiral Allen took off his uniform at one point for a very specific reason. First of all, he had the personal credibility because of Katrina and other events, but at a certain point, working very closely with the elected officials, uh, he in his own mind knew this is time to take off the uniform because I'm a spokesman for the White House for the government right now and uh, he did and he these are discussions that we had he didn't want to put his credibility or the Coast Guard's credibility at risk so of those three things first responders taking care of the operation the political and then the external overlay we always need to keep in mind that that first one is the most important uh, for us Very good. General McKinley well, I think it's pretty simple to say that our citizens expect and deserve the best uh, capabilities possible. They believe that through their elected leaders and through the agencies that uh, our tax dollars support, that we're working hard every day to make sure that we move the ball down the field and are getting better, which I think tonight, I hope, was, was evident. We are not to the finish line. We never will be. Um, I'd like to thank the Kennedy School for this collaboration to Joe Carter for a vision to say this is something we need to do and hopefully we can continue to build on this experience and I look forward to my colleagues who are adjutants general in the states, territories and district to feed me uh, whether this is the type of program that will help us become uh, a better National Guard and you know it's ironic that the, the two courses I've, I, that I've had here at the Kennedy School, one was a U.S.-Russia officer exchange, the other was U.S. Black Sea uh, that, that, that was very helpful to many of us who've taken that course. But what is important now is in the 21st century that this great university college has decided this is also important to us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. 
Uh, Juliet, I, I think, final admonition. Uh, the, what's, what's essential and what's clearly happening here, and I think a, a good news story is, uh, those of you in the military know chain of command, you live, breathe, um, uh, train on it, uh, but that there's a lot of chain of command, some reporting to you, some dotted line, some uh, equal, uh, some in a totally different branch of government that are as important to help you satisfy your primary mission. Uh, the, the primary mission is operational and, the, and, under, and being able to understand and also integrate uh, with those uh, different dotted lines is going to be key uh, uh, for the future success. And this is what makes um, this effort sort of, um, I think, makes it's a very optimistic story about that, that it's not just the pure sort of old fashioned chain of command. Yeah, excellent. Congressman Supak. Thrilled tonight we talked about communication and coordination, so let me go back to where I started. Uh, while we have it in the military, we really need it at the local law enforcement area, and maybe because I came out of law enforcement, I'm so sensitive to it and spend so much time towards it. But all the things we're doing at the federal level and state level doesn't do us any good when a hurricane or the tornadoes like in Alabama hit if the locals cannot talk and coordinate that response to save lives and coordinate the response. So I take that as a, we ought to pull that also into our, our program. So as I want to, as, as I bring us to a close here, I just want to draw attention to one thing which I think is important not to miss, because I think it would have been uh, something of a miracle uh, to get this particular group onto a stage 10 years ago. I don't think it would have been possible to do. And I think it is a symbol of the fact that we have moved far forward and of the leadership, particularly of these three commanders, of these three military elements, uh, who would work successfully together because they do know each other and because they are working on that and trying to make you all uh, able to do that as well going forward. So I think. Uh, we owe you all an enormous uh, uh, vote of confidence and support and our thanks um, as, uh, uh, as a school, as a nation, uh, as we look forward into uh, whatever our future brings us for the leadership that you have brought to this. Um, now, you all, some of you have heard me tell this story before. It's my favorite story, and I, I only have one story at a time. So uh, forgive me if you've heard it before, but it's a story about one of my colleagues at the business school who got a card from his wife, and he opened it, and on the front it said, you were the answer to my prayers. And he thought, oh, that's great. And he opened it up and it said, you're not what I prayed for, but you're the answer I got. <laughs> now, I think what we've discovered tonight is that these folks here arrayed before us and these folks on the stage are the answer to our prayers. And they are also what we should have been praying for, even if maybe we weren't. So I want to thank you all for being here. Please join me in thanking the panel for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really yeah. appreciate you being here. Congressman, thank you, sir. Thanks, Dean. Admiral, it's a huge privilege. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be with you.